present this series that we just kicked off last week called Restart. And the reason why we're doing a series called Restart is that for some reason, at the beginning of the new year, we tend to be most open to change in the most important areas, in our hearts, in our relationships, in our attitudes, our behaviors. You know, last week, Dr. Jack Groppel helped us to realize that life change always starts with mind change. Makes sense. Life change always starts with mind change. And we're going to take that a little bit further today with help from some of the most famous musicians and songwriters in all of history. So King David, John Lennon, Kurt Cobain, and Mick Jagger walk into a bar. <laughs> Hope that doesn't sound like the beginning of a bad joke because it's actually my message, all right? That's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about a conversation between these guys around Psalm 19. I got to tell you, the first time I've ever heard it, Psalm 19 resonated with me. And it's like when you hear a song that you like, and what do you do, right? You start kind of nodding a little bit. Don't worry, I'm not going to move much more than this. You start moving, <laughs> snapping your fingers. Maybe you're humming a little bit. It gets into you, right? You start to engage with it. Well, that's a pretty cool idea because actually Psalm 19 is a song. I don't know if you knew this, but all of the Psalms are actually songs. The book of Psalms is actually like the top 40 list of ancient Israel. And King David, he wrote Psalm 19. And King David was like a rock star, like a rock star literally in ancient Israel. Because not only was he the king, which is a pretty cool thing to be able to say, but he was also a prolific musician, the number one poet and songwriter in scripture. Now, the late C.S. Lewis, the former atheist and professor at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, who became a Christian once he considered the claims of scripture, said this about Psalm 19. It is the greatest poem in scripture and one of the greatest songs in the world. Now, I don't care what kind of songs you write. That is a pretty impressive, uh, you know, statement about your artistry, isn't it? That's pretty remarkable to be able to hear that. So we're going to listen to this song today. We're going to learn its lyrics for our lives. We're going to hum its tune in our hearts. We're going to get our, our lives in sync with the beat of this song. And as we do that, it's going to inspire and challenge us to restart what I think we might want to call a God response this year. Kick off the brand new year, deepening what we would call, should call, our God response. In other words, we respond to what God reveals. We respond to what God reveals. Because how you respond to what God reveals to you about himself determines the quality and the trajectory of your life. It does. You can ignore what God reveals to you, or you can respond to what God reveals. It's your choice. But just know that the choice you make will determine the quality and the trajectory of your life. And so here's the twist. We're going to learn this ancient song of Psalm 19 through the lens of three other modern songs. We're going to eavesdrop on a conversation between King David, John Lennon, Kurt Cobain, and Mick Jagger as they're in a bar or a coffee shop or something shooting the breeze about music and life. I think it's going to be a fun way for us to learn this. Because when I came across Lewis's comment that Psalm 19 is one of the greatest songs ever, that got me thinking. Has anybody ever done like uh, uh, any kind of research around what are the greatest songs of all time? So what are the greatest songs in all of history. And as I explored that a little bit, as I dug around about that, I found out that not too long ago, Rolling Stone, which is, you know, one of the biggest magazines, most, most well-known ma music magazines in, in the music industry, actually did a study with this, where they hired 170, 170 musicians, industry leaders, and critics to compile a list of what they call the 500 greatest songs of all time. Now, this is in the rock uh, a genre, okay, which has really only been around for less than six decades, but these are the 500 greatest songs of all time, okay, essentially the worship songs of our culture, and what I mean by that is these are the songs that resonate in our hearts, they ricochet around in our hearts, it's, it's where we live life from a lot of times, and for hundreds of millions of people, these songs are the worship songs of our culture, so I chose three of these from the top 10 greatest songs of all time. Okay? Three songs that resonate, again, with, one, with hundreds of millions of human hearts. Why? Because of their musical artistry. Because of their deep, honest, raw lyrics about the world that we live in. So according to Rolling Stone, the Bible of the music industry, the number three greatest song of all time is John Lennon's Imagine. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this song. Maybe you've heard it once or twice. It's got a beautiful me melody, right? Beautiful melody. Imagine and some very thought-provoking lyrics. If I could just kind of summarize the whole thing, 
in the song, Lennon is saying, hey, imagine there's no heaven, no hell, no religion, no country, no possessions. If we had a world like that, this would be a world where we'd be able to live in the moment, where we'd be able to, to, to live with peace and to live with unity. Wouldn't that be an amazing world? Can you imagine? Now, this is a song that's yearning for a godless utopia, really. A godless utopia, uh, which is why it's come to be known as the atheist's anthem. John Lennon himself is a self-proclaimed atheist. But imagine John Lennon and David sitting down and talking. I mean, no doubt, David carefully listens to, to Lennon share his thoughts on the ugliness of the world around him, just the junk that he's seen in the world around him. He, he listens to his utopian what-ifs. He takes into consideration that Lennon lived during the Vietnam era and the so-called peace movement. Now, no doubt, David is going to compliment Lennon on his melody and the, the raw authenticity of his yearning for a world without pain and injustice. But eventually, eventually in their conversation, I think David would gently and respectfully challenge Lennon's premise that God doesn't exist and that a world without God is actually a better world. I think he'd say, Johnny, is it okay if I call you Johnny? Johnny, I'd like to challenge you on your idea that a world without God is actually a better world. I completely understand and I totally get where you're coming from because when you look around and you see the world around us and all the junk that's happening, it makes you think, well, there can't be a God if all this stuff is happening. But John, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to realize that God is not the cause of your pain. God is not the cause of your pain. Instead, it's misguided people and worldly systems that are actually quite counter to the heart of God. I want you to imagine a new starting point not to deny God exists because of how people misrepresent him and abuse others in his name, but to see how the created universe proves his existence, his greatness, his glory, his majesty, his beauty. And John, I want to encourage you to live from that perspective. We must always be careful, John, never, never to let the ugliness of man's works nullify or overrule or overshadow the beauty of God's works. I think you tell him to look up at the sky as he shares the first verse of a song that he once wrote. Psalm 19. Here's the first verse of this song. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, and it makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. I mean, it's an amazing song. Now, no doubt, as David is talking with Lennon about this, he would share how his love affair with creation began when he was a younger boy. Uh, we know that David started off as a shepherd, and no doubt, his, his love affair with nature and seeing beauty in nature began when he was out in the fields with his flocks. And he would lay down at night and he would just look up and stare at the stars and the beauty of the heavens. And as he beheld the beauty of the, this, the stellar beauty that God has created, he, he just had this deep conviction in his life. God exists. God's real. And that profoundly impacted the way he lived his life as a shepherd all the way up through his life as a king. Now, uh, I wonder what you think about creation. I wonder about what you think about nature. For me, as a, a younger boy, my dad infused into my life and my heart a love for creation. And so I think from the age of about six until I was 16, my dad would take my brother and I, just the three of us, and we would go to Montana or Wyoming or Colorado, and we would just hike in this beautiful mountain settings. And I think I was around 10 years old, when my dad started a new tradition. We went to a tobacco shop and we bought a pipe and we hiked to the top of a mountain on the pinnacle peak of this mountain over the clouds and together my dad and I smoked a pipe and we're looking at the beauty of creation. And it was something we'd do like once a year and it was just the coolest thing to be able to enjoy and I love the mountains which is why I live in the Midwest. They're so beautiful, so breathtaking and I can never get enough of them. I've always had a passion and a love for Scripture. 
about uh, 15 or so years ago, I'll never forget this, one night in November when we were uh, in a place that in, in remote Maine, like far north in Maine, like far away from cities where you don't have man-made light shining up, and uh, it was just a beautiful cloudless night. And uh, we had heard that there was going to be a, a, a meteor shower, and so I talked to Annie about, hey, I think, what do you think about staying up late tonight and going out and just laying on a blanket and looking at the sky? She's like, you go ahead, honey. All right, so... <laughs> She didn't have that same passion for creation. So I went out and I laid on this blanket on the dock and I looked up at the sky. And guys, in an hour, one hour, I counted 122 shooting stars. Some of them were so breathtakingly beautiful that they actually had colors in them as they streamed from one end of the sky to the other. And I remember writing in the margin of my Bible in Psalm 19, beauty is the voice of God. And the date, and then I saw 122 shooting stars. Anybody see the sunrise yesterday? Or the moonrise this morning. I mean, it's beautiful. Moonset this morning is gorgeous. On the way in today, I saw six deer going across the road. I just love creation. Does anybody else feel a deep resonance with what God has made? Does it make you want to praise him? Does it elicit any kind of a response in you? Because he made it for you. He made it for you to enjoy him, to, to resonate with his beauty and his magnificence and his majesty. Does anybody see creation? And does it elicit a response in you? Now, I wonder if something like this would help to grow your response. Take a look at this. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that unbelievable? Those are just stars that we've discovered and planets that we've discovered in the Milky Way galaxy. Just one galaxy. Now let me blow your mind with some other facts about God's creation. Did you know that you could fit 1.3 million Earths into our little tiny sun? You saw the difference in the comparison of our sun versus the other stars that have been discovered just in the Milky Way galaxy. You can fit 1.3 million Earths into our sun. Our sun has a surface temperature of 10 million degrees Fahrenheit. The core of it is 27 million degrees. That's why on a day like today, even when it's cold, you step outside and you can feel its heat on our face. And it's 93 million miles away. That's amazing to me. But I don't know if you could wrap your head around what you just saw in that video. Because the largest star that we've ever discovered is called Canis Majoris. And it's actually a, a Latin phrase which means the big dog. And I think that's so cool. The big dog. It's one billion times bigger and 500,000 times brighter than our own sun. That's crazy. It's 5,000 light years from us. One billion times bigger, 500,000 times brighter than our sun. And it's 5,000 light years from us. It's a good thing that it's that far away. Because 5,000 light years, that's 29 quadrillion miles. That's 29 with 15 zeros after. Did you know numbers were that big? Just to help you with your light year terminology, 5,000 light years from here means that one, one light year, just start there, one light year is 5.88 trillion miles. Because light travels, as Einstein taught us, at 186,000 mi 186, miles per second. That's 671 million miles per hour. That's 5.88 trillion miles per Per year, hence one light year. Canis Majoris, 5,000 light years from us. Our own Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years wide. That's six quintillion miles. 
six with 18 zeros after it. Can you figure that out? <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> and now check this out. If you think that that's incredible stuff, take a look at this. This is an actual picture from the Hubble telescope. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Now, when we look up at the sky, we see little pinpoints of white, right? This is, this is what the Hubble telescope take a look. Now, I want you guys to make sure you're sitting down when you see this, because if you look closer to it, you see all the spirals, and you see the, 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 the little, like the oval shapes. Those are actual individual galaxies. Okay, those aren't just individual stars. Those are galaxies. Scientists, astronomers who studied this picture, which is one little snapshot of our universe, say that there are 10,000 galaxies in this picture. Out of the estimated 200 billion galaxies in the universe and growing. Because Einstein has taught us that the, the universe is continuing to expand at a speed beyond light, and it's ever increasing. God made this. God created the universe. Now, I wonder when the last time was that you reflected on and responded to creation, or what theologians call general revelation. Guys, it's so important to do this, because creation emphatically declares what more and more scientists are affirming, that there is a God, and that he's breathtakingly glorious and beautiful and majestic and powerful. I'm sure a bunch of you have seen this article that was in the Wall Street Journal just a couple of weeks ago by Eric Metaxas because it went viral after it came out in late December. It's an article entitled, Science Increasingly Makes the Case for God. And it talks about how more and more scientists, prominent scientists, astronomers are coming out saying, considering the unbelievable odds and the fine-tuning of the universe to be able to support life on this one planet, it just points to the existence of a God of intelligent design, the, reg the, the, the natural order, the regularity that you see in the universe. More and more scientists are saying, this is this proof of God's existence. See, God reveals himself in creation, and he invites us to respond to him through it. His creation proves that he's bigger and more beautiful than we could ever imagine. And when we respond to what God reveals by celebrating his glory and greatness, it humbles us. It right-sizes our problems. It gives us a grander perspective to, to the little situation that we might be stuck in. It changes the way we think, the way we live, the way we treat others. You can still imagine the beauty of a world without evil and injustice, a, a world of peace and unity, but now you can live with the power of the God of creation inside of you to best live that out. But to do that, you have to respond to what God reveals. So I think David would talk to Lenin and he'd say, hey, John, can you imagine, can you imagine a beautiful and powerful, infinitely beautiful and infinitely powerful God at the center of your life? Okay, the number nine greatest song of all time is Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit. Now, this is a wonderfully energetic song. It's probably a part of a lot of our running mixes. It's part of mine. But this energetic song is unbelievably cynical about life. And it, it, it resonates with hundreds of millions of people in our culture. Because this is, while wonderfully energetic and cynical, it's this, this declaration from the younger generation, their denial of the meaning of life. The song, if you're familiar with it, it bemoans how low humanity has sunken with its drunk on entertainment approach to life. Its chorus angrily shouts, with the lights out, it's less dangerous. Here we are now, entertain us. I feel stupid and contagious. Here we are now, entertain us. It's just this ticked off declaration of meaninglessness and despair. It's about anger and confusion and being angry about being confused. Now, Kurt Cobain, the band's lead singer, guitarist, and songwriter, he muses at one point in this song whether there's more to life. Uh, but then he quickly follows it up with this defeatist whatever, never mind. The song does more than summarize the heart of our times, though. It also summed up Cobain's own despair. Because at the age of 27, tragically, this young atheist took his life with a shotgun. He left behind a suicide note, though. And in the suicide note, he explained that the reason why he couldn't take it anymore was because from the age of seven, he had developed an intense hatred for all of humanity and a guilt beyond words. So tragic. He moved from meaninglessness to despair to death. Now, some of you might be familiar with Nirvana, and it's extremely ironic because, ironically, the band is named after the final goal of Buddhism, which is Nirvana, which refers to an enlightened, transcendent state where a person is released from the effects of karma and the cycle of death and rebirth. It's a state free of desire, free of suffering, free of self. 
Buddhist monks say that it takes years of meditation to reach the state of nirvana. But this is Eastern meditation, which challenges people to consciously empty our minds of anything and everything, to focus on an emptiness. Without question, David would hear Kurt's despair. He'd empathize with his pain, but then, no question about it, he would assure him that there's another path of life, that he doesn't have to live a life in an existence of meaninglessness and despair and ultimately death, but there's another path of life, a path with meaning, a path with hope, a path of true life and a path of joy. Surely, he would share the biblical concept of meditation, where we fill our minds, where we soak our minds, saturate our minds, stockpile in our minds God's mind and thoughts. Surely, he'd share with Cobain that we get these thoughts, we get God's mind and God's heart through Scripture, through God's Word, through the Bible. And this is what he would say in the next verse of his song. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. In just these five verses, David puts on like a clinic about what God's word is all about. He tells us what God's word is, and he tells us what God's word offers. He tells us what, the, the nature of God's word and the power of God's word. Just to summarize what we just read there, to take it out of its beautiful song and just put it in some lists. God's word is perfect. It means it's complete. It means it, it, it has no errors, no flaws in it. It's trustworthy. You can rely on God's word. It's right. It's radiant, pure, eternal, sure. It's righteous, precious, and sweet. And it revives the soul. This is talking about life, ultimate, fundamental life. It brings wisdom and deep joy and light and spiritual wealth, sweetness, warning, great reward if we live it, if we follow it. Essentially, God's word is his mind and heart to us. And what it offers is his life and his wisdom and his joy to us. This is God's word. And this is one of the reasons why we as a church teach God's word. It's one of the reasons why we, when we come in here, when we gather the church together, we give each and every one of you one of these little Bible cards. You got one when you came in today. And it helps you to understand God's word. It helps you to ask questions about it to grow with other people around it, to pray about it. I wonder how many of those cards end up in the trash. And I wonder how many of them actually end up being used. Guys, you're leaving treasure on the table. If you don't use that, use it. It's God's word. It's powerful. And it'll enrich your life. It's one of the reasons why we have classes like how to read your Bible. Some of you might hear this stuff and you're like, well, great. I've never been able to really understand how to read my Bible. That's not an excuse anymore. We've got classes and we've got workshops that can help you to do that in just a couple weeks. There's one coming up. There's information in your program about it. You saw the, the CG before the service. How to read your Bible. Just a one-time shot. 90 minutes. You can understand how to read your Bible. It's not that hard. And you can experience this in your life. It's the power of God's word. And it's an incredible thing to be able to enjoy in life. So just recapping where we come from. Creation is known as general revelation, where God reveals general aspects of his character, his greatness, his power, his beauty. But scripture is known as special revelation, where God reveals specific aspects of his character and his redemptive plan, like his grace and his mercy and his love. And scripture has all kinds of things to say about itself. That it's God breathed, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that it's useful for us, that it's living and active, Hebrews 4, 12. That we can be planted like a tree by a stream of water, Psalm 1. This Psalm that we're looking at, Psalm 119, which is the longest Psalm in Scripture, is all about God's Word. God's Word is powerful and it can bring life. Now, David poetically reinforces this idea this way in this particular Psalm. In the first several verses that we looked at about creation, he uses one particular name for God. He uses the, the Hebrew name El, and that means mighty one. So the mighty one, the God of creation is what he's saying there. But then in these last five verses that we looked at, he uses another name for God. And I don't know if you caught it as we were reading through it, but he kept saying the ordinances of the Lord, the law of the Lord. That word Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh, 
Whenever you see small caps for Lord, it means Yahweh. That is God's covenant, personal, relational name. David is saying something beautiful as he's singing something through this amazing song to us. He's helping us to realize that we can actually grow, we can actually grow a relationship with God by filling our minds with God's word. Not getting through it, but getting it through us. Because God's word brings life and wisdom and joy. But again, the focus, the emphasis is on filling our minds, not emptying them. David is daring us to meditate on scripture because he knows what it's like when you saturate your mind, when you stockpile it in your heart. He knows what it's like to taste it and then to test it, to trust it, and then come to treasure it. Is that how you are responding to what God has revealed? Is that how you're responding to scripture? Mark Buchanan uh, wrote a fantastic book called Your God is Too Safe. And this is what he said. He said in there, if you call yourself a quote-unquote believer, but live without meditation, and you're just diving into God's word, you're just a spiritual romantic. You're looking for relationship without any of the effort. Now, man, is that convicting to me. I can remember when I first trusted Christ in, in my mid-20s, and some, some days I would spend three or four hours in God's word. I just could not get enough of it. It just fed me and fueled me. I love God's word. And then there are seasons of my life where I go through where I'm like, oh yeah, there's that resource that I could kind of run to and find life and wisdom and joy. But you get distracted, don't we? And we start to run in other directions and we start to run down different paths until we experience enough pain or enough meaninglessness or enough despair or enough, enough death around us that our minds are quickened to the fact that God's word exists. God exists. He's given us his word. He's revealed his mind and heart to us. And if we stay in it every day, that's why Bill challenges us around the 15 minutes a day, our chair time. If we stay in God's word, it'll get into and through us. See, the goal isn't to read it from cover to cover necessarily. The goal even more is to get it through us, not to get you through it, but to get it through us. It's the power of God's word. Now, that's one aspect of special revelation. The other aspect of special revelation is very important to point out, and that is we just came out of Christmas, right? And in Christmas, we celebrate the birth of someone very important, don't we? He's actually a descendant in the royal line of David, and his name is? Come on, it's meant to be low-hanging fruit for you. Jesus, right? Making sure you're still with me. Okay, you're getting me scared. Jesus, all right? Jesus is who we just celebrated at Christmas. Now, isn't it interesting that hundreds of thousands of songs have been written about Jesus throughout history. More songs than of anybody else who ever walked the planet. Why would that be? You ever think about that? Why would that be? Because as the Son of God who came to rescue and redeem us, Jesus Christ is the fullest and most personal revelation of God to humanity. Now here's where the Apostle Paul would join the chat between David and Kurt Cobain and he'd share some new revelation from his vantage point in redemptive history. No question he would share Colossians 2.9. In Jesus Christ, the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. Talking about the incarnation, how God himself is Jesus in human flesh. In Jesus, the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. In 2 Corinthians 4, 6, But God, who made light shine out of the darkness, talking about creation, talking about general revelation, has made his light to shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's a special revelation, God's word in Jesus. See, the pinnacle of special revelation, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. The pinnacle of special revelation is the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, God has most perfectly revealed himself through Jesus Christ, his son. Now, Bono is the lead singer of U2. I know you didn't know that, but Bono was one time interviewed by a French music critic, musician, and uh, the critic said this. So Christ has his rank among the world's greatest thinkers, but son of God, isn't that far-fetched? Bono responds this way, and I want to read it to you because it's a fantastic response. It's a long one, but it's great. No, it's not far-fetched to me. Look, the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this. He was a great prophet, obviously a very interesting guy, had a lot of things to say along the lines of other great prophets like Elijah, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius. But actually, Christ doesn't allow you that. He doesn't let you off that hook. Christ says, no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me a teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. Don't call me a prophet. I'm saying I am the Messiah. I'm saying I am God incarnate. 
and people say, no, no, please, just be a prophet. The prophet we can take. You're a bit eccentric, but we've had John the Baptist eating locusts and wild honey. We can handle that. But don't mention the M word, because you know if, if you do that, we're going to have to crucify you. And Jesus goes, no, 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 I, I know that you're expecting me to come back with an army and set you free from all these creeps, but actually, I am the Messiah. At this point, everybody starts staring at their shoes and they say, oh my gosh, he's going to keep saying this. So what you're left with, Bono says, so what you're left with is either Christ was who he said he was, the Messiah, or a complete nutcase. I mean, we're talking nutcase on the level of Charles Manson. I'm not joking here, he says. The idea that the entire course of civilization could have its fate changed and turned upside down by a nutcase, for me, that's far-fetched. What an extraordinary and theologically astute and exquisite response to a question off the cuff. Could you answer that way? Do you know God well enough that way? Do you know Jesus well enough that way that you could respond that way? See, Scripture's claims about Christ, and even Christ's claims about himself. Guys, please listen to this. They force us into an all-or-nothing decision, an all-or-nothing response because think about it, is it really possible for a psychotic man to produce the kind of impact on his followers and in the world as Jesus has? Now, if Jesus wasn't an utter crackpot, nutjob lunatic, then our only other alternative is to accept his claims and center our lives around him. But one thing we cannot do, one thing intellectual integrity will not allow us to do, is to respond to him with neutrality or to respond to him with shades of gray. If Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be, then you can fill your mind and your heart with his life and his wisdom and his joy by trusting in him and by following his teachings in the scriptures. But in other words, you must respond to what God has revealed. Now let's finish up with the number two greatest song of all time, the Rolling Stones, Satisfaction. All right? Maybe some of you are familiar with the song. It's pretty simple and straightforward. It does not require an awful lot of, like, interpretation, does it? It's a, it's a pretty, like, right at you song. Now, this song, in this song, Mick Jagger, the one on the left, and also an atheist, he heckles our hedonistic culture about the futility, the futility of trying to please ourselves with sex and stuff. And he's tried, and he's tried, and he's tried. Oh, he's tried, but he can't get no satisfaction. No, no, no. But hey, 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 let me just ask you this question. What if life isn't ultimately about pleasing ourselves? Did you realize that that's the question he's asking in the song? It's actually a brilliantly artistic song. He's actually asking in the song underneath these lyrics, kind of comes at you sideways, but he's actually saying, he's actually asking this very powerful question. Ultimately, ultimately, is life really about pleasing ourselves? So after giving Mick some kudos for the catchy guitar riff and, and the clever way he gets at that question, after explaining how that song would have really been an actually uh, a fitting soundtrack for David's own uh, shallow seasons of life, I think David would have messed with Mick's mind here a little bit. And I think he'd talk about ultimate satisfaction. I, I think he would talk about how ultimate satisfaction counterintuitively is not about pleasing ourselves. I think he would actually share the final line of the song that he wrote in Psalm 19 that shows that David's ultimate goal in life, that David's number one life resolution, his chief desire, his foremost longing, what he wanted to live for was to please God. Take a look at this verse, the way he closes this off. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh, Lord. Again, there's that relational term. Oh, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. See, this psalm, this song is about pleasing God by responding to what he's revealed. So how about it? I mean, really, how about it in your life? Ultimately, do you want to use God or do you want to please God? I mean, think about the vast majority of prayers that come out of your mouth. When was the last time that God heard a prayer like this out of your mouth? God, what can I do for you today? God, how can I serve you with my life, the life that you've given me? Now, I would venture a guess that a vast majority of the prayers that we sling upwards are requests about ways to enhance our satisfaction. 
God, would you get me out of this jam? Would you give me influence with that guy or with that girl or with my boss? Would you give me health? Would you give me wealth? God, can I have that parking spot? Don't ask me how I know these. <laughs> but can you imagine how we must sound like a broken record to God? Like fingernails on a cosmic chalkboard? Can you just imagine the sound of our prayers to God's ears when they're about our satisfaction? But David says, Yahweh, after being captivated by your greatness and glory in creation, after cultivating my relationship with you by trusting Scripture and treasuring Scripture, and, and then we would add with the New Testament, after experiencing your love and grace and mercy by trusting in your Son, Jesus, let me please you. See, to reveal his greatness and glory, God gave us creation. To reveal his wisdom and plan for us, God gave us scripture. And to reveal his love and grace and mercy, God gave us Christ. And all this revelation demands, calls for, invites, entices us, woos us into a response. And when we celebrate his creation, when we treasure his word, and when we trust his son, our response actually pleases God. David's life became a song that pleased God. So much so that later, God actually said this about David. David was a man after my own heart. Wow. I want that to be said about my life. Don't you want that to be said about yours? See, your life, my life can be a pleasing song to God's ears. Your life, my life, our lives can be songs that he puts on repeat on his heavenly favorites playlist where he jacks up his heavenly stereo system. Can you imagine the sound quality? <laughs> Your life can be a pleasing song in God's ears. See, here's the coolest thing. What do you do when you love a song? What do you do when you love a song? You sing it. You sing it, don't you? I absolutely love this verse. Check this verse out. Zephaniah 3, 17. Yep, that's really a book of the Bible. And yep, this is really a verse. This is from God's word, God's mind and heart. To you, to us, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty one who saves. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you by his love. Read this with me. He will rejoice over you with singing. With what? With singing. And stop and think about who created music. God did. God created it for our enjoyment. And when you respond to what he reveals, you delight the heart of God so much that he sings over you. I mean, imagine that. Now, I got a theory. I don't think that, that God is singing over us, hey, Jude. I don't think he's singing, take me to church. I don't think he's singing some Jay-Z song or some Taylor Swift song. This is what I think God is singing. This is just a theory. Can't prove this. One day we'll find out. But I think he's singing your song. The pleasing song that your life is writing, that you are co-writing a song with God and God loves to sing it over your life. When you respond to what he reveals, your life becomes a pleasing song in his ears and he sings it over you. 